Okay, we're actually recording now. Um, so if we only have things that are bonds for our electron regions, it's pretty straightforward. But what happens if we run into a situation where we have lone pairs? Um, from the table, you can kind of see that we have these new names that show up. Um, I'm going to direct our attention over to the simulation to talk through what's happening. And then I'm going to refer us back to the table to help understand that a little bit better. So if we go back to our simplest little molecule here where we've got two atoms and they're bound with one another. We said that this electron geometry was linear. If we turn on, or we said our molecular geometry was linear. Now if we turn on our electron geometry, it's also linear. So in the case of a situation where we have no lone pairs, our molecular geometry will be the exact same thing as our electron geometry. So to illustrate that just a little bit more, if we put one more bonding region in, we get trigonal planar as the molecular, trigonal planar as the electron geometry. Excuse me. But what happens if we add a lone pair in instead? Okay. So if we add a lone pair in instead, now we have a 120 degree bond angle happening because this is a bond, this is a bond. This lone pair is not a bond. It's just a lone pair. See the two little electrons in there? So cute. I want to pinch our little cheeks. Now we have a situation where our electron geometry is going to be the trigonal planar because this is a region, this is a region, and this is a region, and they all orient in that trigonal planar geometry, electron geometry. But if we are not actually looking at the lone pairs, if they're still there, they're still totally there. But if we're not showing them, this is what the molecule will end up being looking like. Specifically, it looks like this molecule is bent, right? It's got a 120 degree angle, but it looks like it is bent a little bit. Like you just kind of bent it over your knee. Um, so this really does have this lone pair right here. But we don't really see lone pairs because they don't really stick out that far out in space. Um, but we do see... The, mole the molecule have a geometry that looks something like this. What happens if we have three bonding regions and one non-bonding region? Now, a non-bonding region would be our lone pair, and bonding regions would be our bonds. Well, now we have 109.5 degree angles. Well, that was the same as our tetrahedral. So our electron geometry is still going to be tetrahedral. Our molecular geometry, though, we're going to call trigonal pyramidal. And that's because if we hide that lone pair for a second, this looks a bit like a pyramid, right? So here's our base with our terminal atoms. And then the top of the pyramid would be our central atom, trigonal pyramidal. Turn on our lone pair again. We add another bond. All right. This is where things get a little bit of fun. Now we have a steric number of five. We have five electron regions. So our electron geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, but our molecular geometry is what we're gonna call seesaw. The reason it is called seesaw is, if I can get this to move, please just do it. Okay, that's kind of close. If you can imagine the atom in the back and the atom in the front are sitting on a table, and this atom over here, you had a person sitting on, you could have somebody else sitting on over here and you could just rock back and forth like a seesaw. seesaw. Yeah. So the important thing here is that when we, so let's uh, remove that lone pair, but let's put another bonding pair in. When we had just a, uh, all, a steric number of five and no lone pairs, we had these 109 degree bond or 100 um, pfft, we had these 90 degree bond angles the 120 degree bond angles we had our axial and our equatorial atoms when we remove one and we add a lone pair in 
our axial atoms are not the atoms that get replaced. It is one of our equatorial atoms. That's really important. The reason why is it one of our equatorial atoms and not an axial atom? Because, or I guess region, it's not an atom. An axial region versus an equatorial region. The reason it's an equatorial region is because the whole premise of this theory is to minimize electron pair repulsions. Putting this electron pair in an equatorial position allows for the repulsions to be minimized between the other electron regions. That's the name of the game. How do you minimize the amount of electron pair repulsions? By putting a lone pair here, we have a 90 degree repulsion, a 90 degree repulsion, and then two 120s. If we put the lone pair in one of our axial positions, we would have three 90 degree interactions. That's more energetic. It takes more energy for that to occur than two 90s and then two 120s. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It, it really comes down to energetics. If we put one more bond in, we have a steric number of six because we have six regions. So we have an electron geometry of octahedral, but now our shape is going to be called square pyramidal. And that's because, look, it's a square pyramid. It's a pyramid with a square base. Super exciting. This is where the table now comes into play. The table says with one lone pair, we have a bent shape. We have a trigonal pyramidal shape, we have a seesaw shape, we have a square pyramidal shape, and it gives you examples of how to draw them. What happens if you have two lone pairs? Well, if you have two lone pairs, you can't have anything here with a stark number of three that we're interested in. Um, so that's why that is not showing up here. But if you have a stark number of four and two of the regions are lone pairs, well, we have a different form of bent. Now we have a bent, but now the bond angle is 109.5. If we go to the T shape, well, if we go to trigonal by pyramidal, so a steric number of five, but we have two lone pairs, we end up with this thing that we call a T shape. Again, why is it T? Because of electron pair repulsions and minimizing those. So th that's where this table is coming from. It's saying, how do we minimize these repulsions? And then what does the stuff look like? So this isn't the only table under the sun. Um, there's this table, and I don't know where the attribution, I don't know where I got it. I looked for it briefly online, couldn't find it. So I apologize for not having an attribution. Um, this table puts what's your steric number across the top, how many lone pairs do you have across the bottom, and then you just play a nice little game of find your steric number, find your lone pairs, connect them over. It will tell you what the name of the structure is. It will also tell you what, what your bond angle is. It will also tell you whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar. The only way that this polar and nonpolar works, though, is if we are assuming that our atoms, the central and the terminal atoms, have different electronegativities. If you run into having the exact same electronegativity, it's, it may or may not work. This table is your, if you memorize this one, you'll get an 80% on an exam because it's gonna, you're gonna find it to not be uh, complete enough 20% of the time. That 20% of the time, you're gonna have to know the information and be able to think like that simulation to rationalize different topics um, and different kinds of like nuanced scenarios. This is really good for the non-nuanced stuff. This table, which is a lot bigger, gives you uh, not information about polarity, but it does give you more information in terms of bond angles. Um, and it also breaks it down in terms of bonding regions versus lone pairs. It gives you the Vesper class name, 
uh, gives you examples of how to draw the shapes out, and it also gives you some examples of molecules. So if you wanted to draw those molecules out uh, and prove it to yourself from a Lewis structure, then you could walk through this table. One thing that this table does is it gives you uh, what's called uh, hybridization, and that's here in parentheses. Um, the quick and dirty truth about hybridization in general chemistry one is you can just memorize a steric number. Uh, and so that's the same thing as on this table. It's like the number of electron groups and the steric number is going to tell you your hybridization. So if you have a steric number of two, your hybridization on your central atom will be SP. You don't have to have an idea of what that really means, um, but you can regurgitate it. And that is the honest truth about hybridization. We're going to go over what hybridization is, but punchline, you're going to be able to just regurgitate. And we already did the simulation. So that's the rough gist of Vesper. Do you have any questions? I don't think so. Okay. It all makes like common sense when I just think about it. Yeah, Vesper is one of those that, um, uh, bah, 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 there we go. Vesper is one of those that if you play around with this um, simulation for a while and you try to ask yourself, what does that mean? And you try to draw what you see with the wedge and dash, it, it, it works really nicely. Um, one thing that I would say on this simulation that we didn't cover that I forgot. Um, you can go over to real molecules here at the bottom of the page, um, which is kind of nice because what the real molecules will do is it'll, it'll bring up something like water. Um, and so if you draw out the Lewis structure for water, you're going to see that it's going to have a steric number of four, but it's going to have two lone pairs. So the lone pairs are going to show up something like this because that steric number is four. It's tetrahedral. Because it's got two lone pairs, based off one of those tables, we said, hey, that's called bent in its molecular geometry. Because you said it's a steric number of four, the bond angles you would expect to be 109.5 degrees. But if we show what the bond angle really is, it's 104.5. 104.5 is close to 109.5, but it's not 109.5. The reason for the discrepancy, because like we said, it should be 109, but it's really this 104.5. The reason for this discrepancy is the lone pairs. The lone pairs aren't, the, and I mentioned this before, lone pairs aren't this far out from the atom. They're actually closer to the atom. Because they're closer to the atom, they're going to repulse more uh, the electron regions from our bonds. So they're going to push our bonds further away from themselves. So by pushing the bond away, it's going to make this bond angle smaller. So in the real world, we're not going to oftentimes, uh, especially if we have lone pairs, we're not going to see those uh, bonds that we predicted. Like if we go to something like methane, methane's a tetrahedral um, geometry and in both electron geometry and molecular geometry, and it's got a steric number of four and no lone pairs. So we just do see 109.5 degrees. Water, electron geometry is tetrahedral, but because of those lone pairs, we don't see the 104.5. Is this kind of ammonia? Yo. Ammonia is tetrahedral, um, but its electron, or I'm sorry, its bond angle is 107.8. We thought it'd be 109.5. It's not because of this lone pair around the nitrogen. If you get something real big and crazy, you can have... Um, yeah, you can get all these different kinds of things. Uh, is this one? No, that wasn't what I wanted. Dang it. Yeah, yeah. And so something like this phosphorus, uh, monophosphorus pentachloride um, is in a trigonal bipyramidal and a trigonal bipyramidal electron and molecular geometries, respectively. Put something with like lone pairs in there. Or I'm sorry, lone pairs with double bonds. Double bonds exist. You can still have double bonds um, 
that only counts as one region of electron density. The lone pair here is still going to push those electron regions further away. So the steric number is three. You'd think that it's going to be trigonal planar electron geometry, which it is. You'd, because it's trigonal planar, you'd say, oh, it's 120 degrees, but it's not. It's less because it's got a lone pair here pushing this bond, this bonding region closer together because the electron pair is repulsing those bonds away from it more than the bonds can repulse each other. So yeah, it's bent with double bonds, which is fun crazy, um, but the bonding is still going to be less than idealized because of the lone pair. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorites. This is what I was looking for, SF4. So you don't end up with 90 degree bond angles, even though it's trigonal bipyramidal, you end up with these 87.8s because this lone pair pushes everything away from it. So it even makes that 120 degree bond angle that we would have expected in the equatorial position smaller to like 101.6. Because it should have been out here, but it's really right here because the lone pairs are bullies. And with that, we really have now covered everything Vesper related.